Well, amen and good morning. Man, it is so good to be back with you all after a couple weeks out. And what a blessing it was to get away like that. that was yeah, I'm glad that you were able to get away for, I think, two Sundays you were able to be gone. I don't, I don't think I ever did that, Brandon. Two Sundays two back Sundays. to back in 37 years. Now you're really... But you know, it. I look back on a lot of things now and go, I wish I'd done that differently. Uh, I wish I would have taken time off for like a month at a time at, at certain points in order to be renewed and refreshed. And I'm so grateful that you did that. I'm, I hope, hopefully you were renewed and refreshed. Our family had a great time taking some time away, just being together. And I, I tell you though, it is just never the same not being here. And I know like when I came back this morning, if my voice sounds a little scratchy, I just sang it out over there. Like for real, my voice is a little scratchy now, just missing being here singing with you all. I was grateful though that I could hear the messages yeah, online, absolutely. even whenever I was away. And I got to hear Nathan Redman and Steven Dellinger yeah. bring some incredible messages. Yeah. Can we thank those guys again for their preparation and their work? They were Both awesome. these guys, and, and it was Stephen's very first time to preach in an environment like this. Yeah, now, yeah. He, had, he had preached. Yeah, we can celebrate yeah. that for Stephen. <laughs> we we want to be a church committed to make disciples, and um, part of that even means among our elders, among our pastors, in the call that God has placed on our life to be able and ready to teach uh, investing in these guys. And you, you may not know that behind the scenes, there have even been courses that our pastors have taken and Pastor Jerry has helped us lead those courses so that these guys could get training for that specific task of preaching the word. And I think it showed well for Stephen, especially at being, now he's preached a lot to children. He's our, he's our mm. TC Kids leader, our pastor in charge mm. of that, but does a great uh, job. he does a great job there. But he did that here. And then Nathan, that was just his second time to bring a message on Sunday in this environment um, on his own. But Nathan preaches all the time, too, with our student ministry and so many other spaces. So I was really glad to hear from those guys. It was awesome. They it did was. wonderful. And they worked hard in their preparation. We could tell we were the benefactors. We were fed by it. Yeah. Well, this morning. Oh, thank you. That, I appreciate that. I'm very grateful for that. I'm going to use that. Um, this morning, um, we want to turn the page back to Mark's gospel account. And if you have your Bible with you, and I hope you do, would you open with us to Mark 14, 1 through 11? And that's where we're going to pick back up in our journey through Mark's gospel. Yeah, the last time we were in Mark, we were talking about the end times. You may recall that. We, we had a number of messages, I believe there was three, on the end time passages that are in Mark chapter uh, 13. And all of that sprung out of the Olivet, what we know as the Olivet Discourse. And it ha it's called the Olivet Discourse because it happened? On the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives, yeah. right. It's why it's called that. And so and we want to remind you as we get into 14 here that we're in the midst of Passion Week. We're in the last week of Jesus' life. In fact, we're in the last few days of Jesus' life. And uh, boy, the importance of this week called Passion Week right before his death and you know, when someone is approaching the last part of their life, they always say a lot of meaningful things mm -hmm. uh, if they are, you know, Cognitive. spiritual people and they're wanting things to be yeah. uh, remembered. And so that's what we have here from Jesus is all of these important uh, things. And, you know, actually what Pastor Brandon has revealed to us is that Mark's gospel, Mark devoted a third of his gospel account to this one week. And so that, that tells you that how important this really is. So let's get into it. Yeah, let's do that. So you've got your Bible open to that passage. And this uh, passage we're about to read, three stories happen in rapid succession. And they take place just after the Olivet Discourse and right before Jesus shares his Last Supper with his disciples and then is arrested. So these three stories take place very quickly in just 11 verses. So here we go. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster 
flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial for her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, you see these three stories here, right? Uh, in these 11 verses. Pretty amazing. Three stories, 11 verses. You know, the, you have the chief priest and the scribes uh, making their plans to kill Jesus and, mm-hmm. you know, have him arrested and executed. You have that in there. And then all of a sudden you have this anointing of Jesus by this lady and you have the objection of even his disciples to the cost of the perfume. And we're going to talk about that. And then you have the betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot for 30 pieces of silver. So in 11 verses, we have these three stories. Now, what do we have in common here? Well, all three stories share this in common. They all include characters who had irrational thoughts. And all three stories, these characters' irrational thoughts led them to unreasonable behaviors in the way they responded to Jesus, illogical conclusions because they didn't have rational thoughts. Now, I'm sure to them in the moment, their thoughts felt very rational. But from God's perspective, their thoughts were not rational at all, and it made their behavior illogical. In all three cases, what they did and how they responded to Jesus was absurd. All their responses and reactions also also share this in common. They were all rooted in some sort of fear that prompted this irrational train of thought. So let's look at these three and what we can see in their irrational response to Jesus. And the first is the chief priests and the scribes. They were irrational for wanting to kill Jesus. Wouldn't you agree that they were irrational for wanting to kill the Son of God? Mark tells us their plans very plainly. He says that these religious leaders wanted to take Jesus by trickery and put him to death. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to kill somebody? You maybe shouldn't admit to that if you did. I mean, if you were really honest, can you think of a time when you really wanted to kill someone? I can think of several times uh, that I wanted to ultimately take someone's life before I became a Christian. Uh, After I became a Christian, I learned about forgiveness. But, you know, before I became a Christian, I thought there were certain people in my life, I thought it'd be better if they did not exist. And if I had the opportunity to take their life and get away with it, maybe I would. You know, if you want to kill someone... If you had that desire, you've, you've probably seen movies uh, to, that reveal the motive right. why people want to take someone else's life. Normally, they're either motivated by uh, revenge or they're motivated by the de- desire for money or they're motivated by the desire for power. You know, that's what normally motivates these folks, you know, that end up murdering someone. And so, in this story, their desire to murder Jesus was really not based on sound reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, why did they want to murder him? Well, it wasn't based on sound reason because Jesus had never wronged any of them. Jesus never sinned. He never, (laughs) he offended them, but he didn't offend them by doing something wrong to them, by sinning against them. 
And so there really wasn't any basis for revenge right. and wanting to murder him because of that reason. And then Jesus didn't have any money. He didn't have any material possessions that were a benefit to these people that wanted to kill him. And so that wasn't the motive. And then Jesus actually supported their authority with his own disciples as the religious leaders of Israel. He told his own disciples to listen and obey what the scribes and the Pharisees said because he, they sit in the seat of Moses, he right. said. He recognized their authority that they had, but he warned them not to follow the example of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, we know that Jesus did have some harsh things That's to say true. about their motives and the inconsistencies in their character, but everything that he said was right and right. true. He always spoke the truth. Yeah, so it really wasn't logical. It wasn't rational, but it was rational in their own minds. Yeah. They thought that what they were doing, that they were just acting out of necessity and doing what had to be done. And why? Why did they feel that way? Why were they trying to plot to kill Jesus and take him by trickery to get that done? Well, John's gospel actually spells out their motives clearly. And we can find it in John eleven forty seven 47 through 48. It says, then the chief priests, there they are again, and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. And if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And then here it is. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. There's your motive for murder right there. They had, now, it was rational to them. According to scripture, the religious leaders were afraid that Jesus was going to lead some sort of revolt among the Jews. It was going to garnish the attention of the Romans to oppress them even more than they were already being oppressed. And that fear led to a motivation to murder Jesus. That's why they wanted to kill him. And it may have made sense in their minds, but their reasoning was totally irrational. And let me just show you why. It was never Jesus' agenda or intention or his stated mission to overthrow the Roman authority or to overthrow the authority of the chief priest and the scribes. No. He never one time said that that's what he came to do. Everything that Jesus said about his mission had nothing to do with replacing the Romans. In fact, he would put people in check when they talked about replacing the Romans. He would actually put them in check for saying that. And then he had never had any motivation to replace like the chief priest and the scribes and the Pharisees with some of his own disciples. Jesus didn't ever say that that's what he came to do. In fact, his behavior and what he did do revealed the opposite. For example, do you remember that Jesus healed the son of a centurion? Yeah, a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion. So he's doing the opposite of what they're thinking he is about and what he's going to do. Jesus always paid his taxes. Jesus showed compassion to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. And he showed compassion to him and met with him when he asked to meet with him. And here's maybe the biggest one in my mind. They're, they have this fear of this revolt and this uprising. Not once did Jesus ever carry a sword. Not one time, but here they are saying, oh, he's going to cause this uprising and the Romans, he's going to get the Romans' attention. It was completely irrational, maybe logical in their own minds, but not based on solid reasoning. The chief priests and the scribes were plotting to kill Jesus, and it was unreasonable, and it was based on their fears. It was based on what they feared. So that's the first character and how that plays out in them. And then you have this second group of characters, and it's, to me it's sort of funny uh, how irrational they were. Uh, this is the, the group that, uh, and his own disciples, or some of his own disciples, including Judas, that was part of being offended by this woman who came and anointed Jesus with this expensive perfume. And, you know, that's incredible. Uh, <laughs> think about it. They were offended, this is his own people, by this expensive perfume being, being used in this way. Right. It says in Matthew 26, 7 through 9, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant. Come on, 
Think about that. They were indignant, saying, why this waste for this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and much and then given to the poor? Ah, oh, man. And you know what Matthew's gospel account reveals here? That Mark's, Mark's gospel just said some among them were indignant like this. Look at what's highlighted in Matthew's gospel account. When his disciples saw it. Yeah. So these are, these are his own disciples who are indignant about this uh, offering that this woman is giving to Jesus. Now, their indignation was based on the price of the perfume and what it costs. Now, they, they've got a little bit of a point. Um, again, it felt irrational in their own minds. They said it could have been sold for 300 denarii. 300 denarii, a denarii was about an average day's labor's pay. 300 denarii was about a year's salary. It was approaching a year's salary for the average worker. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of so, money. So we can say, okay, I see where they're coming from, but they believe, the disciples believed that Jesus is the Messiah. They believed that. That's why they were following him, that he's the son of God. That's what Peter declared in Matthew 16. Let me ask you, if Jesus is the Messiah and the son of God, what does he deserve from this world? Or let me ask you this in this way. What is he not worthy to receive from us? Well, certainly not a bottle of perfume on his head. <laughs> right. I mean, this is what his disciples uh, are yeah, thinking. Exactly. Is, You're not worth a bottle of perfume. Yeah. Is what they're basically saying. But this morning we sang, you're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Is he not worthy of any and every offering that we could yeah. bring? Is he not worthy of more than the offerings that we could bring? If we brought all of our offerings that we could collectively possibly bring to King Jesus, would he not be infinitely worthy of more than what we could bring him? Was he not worthy of the anointing of this woman and this act of kindness that she showed Jesus to prepare his body for burial? He is worthy. He is worthy of of it all and here's how Jesus responds to the illogical reasoning of his disciples they thought she was in the wrong and Jesus rebukes his disciples and praises the woman yeah for what she does listen in Mark 14 6 through 8 but Jesus said let her alone I love that let her alone why do you trouble her she has done a good work for me for you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. And what about this argument of selling the perfume and giving it uh, to the poor? I mean, come on. We're talking about Jesus. Uh, why would that be unreasonable? For them to object upon that particular basis well these disciples were poor yeah and for three and a half years they had followed jesus and they hadn't missed a meal yet <laughs> yeah some way somehow he came up with food for all 12 of these guys and and many other people you know when they needed it and they didn't miss one one meal at all right. and then they were there these disciples were there when he fed 4,000 men with only a few fish and a few pieces of bread, and then another time when he fed 5,000. I mean, if Jesus needed to come up with resources to feed the poor, he could come up with them. He could do it. Uh, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and it's like, come on, uh -huh. give me a break. That particular ar argument, uh, their objection to this woman's act was based on fear that her offering was a waste, they say. Mm. And it's amazing how fear, like we saw in the first story, how fear can cause us to call right wrong and to call wrong right. Ooh. And we see it in this story. Yeah, it, we saw it in the religious leaders. They were definitely calling right wrong when they planned to kill Jesus. We saw it in the disciples. They were calling right wrong when they rebuked the woman for anointing Jesus. And there's one more character, the third character in these stories, who responds to Jesus was unreasonable, is specifically identified by Mark as Judas Iscariot. Mark 14, 10 through 11. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, 
they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Now, to me, Judas' reasoning might have been the most irrational, unlogical of all three stories. He had been a disciple of Jesus, and he was a disciple of Jesus whose fears led him to betray to death the Son of God. Yeah, you know, uh, Judas Iscariot, yeah, he would have heard, uh, first heard of Jesus from John the Baptist, like most all the other disciples had done, yeah. and had to have a measure of faith in what John was saying was true about the coming of the Messiah to even start out being a disciple of right. Jesus. And then, so he'd been with them from the beginning. And, and so he's walked with Jesus for uh, three, you know, three and a half years. He's been personally loved by Jesus during that time. Mm -hmm. You know, there was times when Jesus, you know, was with all the disciples, but there was times, obviously, in three and a half years when he was one-on-one -on -one with Judas, mm -hmm. and he was, he was ministering to Judas one-on-one -on -one in his own life. Uh, he had seen every miracle that Jesus had performed, okay? He was a firsthand witness to every one of these mis uh, miracles. Uh, he had been on mission trips for Jesus. Think about that. Judas himself went on mission trip trips for Jesus, and while he was on those mission trips, he pronounced the coming of the kingdom. And not only that, Judas Iscariot performed signs and wonders yeah. in the name of Jesus, and it worked. I mean, right. he cast out demons in the name of Jesus and healed sick in the name of Jesus. And then you have he knew all of these prophecies about the Messiah from the Old Testament. I and mean, he was a Jew and he was trained well. And Jesus was teaching them how Jesus fulfilled all of these different prophecies. And he witnessed Jesus predict the future. And then he watched those predictions come true yeah. during the time that he was with Jesus. And Jesus had even promised them now. All of those disciples, he said, you know, when I come into my kingdom, all of you are going to sit on a throne. He had promised Judas Iscariot that. Yeah. He knew all about those future rewards. So why in the world, all of a sudden, yeah. he abandoned ship? It doesn't make any sense. It's illogical. And Judas had all these personal revelations from Jesus unfold right before his very eyes. And despite that, he conspires with Jesus' enemies to betray Jesus for a meager 30 pieces of silver. Judas had to have fears, right? I mean, can you, can you maybe try? I, it's illogical. It's unreasonable. But can we try to see that at least Judas was processing here in some way that made it feel like to him that this was the best plan forward? He thought that this was the best direction for him to go. And so what's going on? Well, he's motivated by fear. Think about what's been happening in Mark leading up to right now. What's been happening is Jesus has been proclaiming that he's going to die. Well, that's got to prompt fear in Judas, don't you think? You've been following him three years. You, you expect him to be the Messiah. Certainly, if Judas caught wind of anything Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, that would have prompted fear. We've already been through those end-time events and being among the first to hear that. But then the other thing that could have been prompting fear in Judas is he was on the Temple Mount witnessing the conflict between Jesus and the religious yeah. leaders. Yeah, that was true. So he knew this heated environment. Mm. Which side is he going to side with? Is he going to side with Jesus, who seems for whatever illogical reason mm. even even though he's seen the great power of jesus who seems less powerful to judas in this moment than these religious leaders and so he's deciding where's my fortunes lie where's my fate best directed is it with jesus or is it with these religious leaders who want him dead and apparently he knew something about how badly they wanted him dead because he sought them out to conspire against Jesus. Judas's fears led him to take matters into his own hands, to become the master of his own ship. He made a plan to take care of his future, and that plan included 30 pieces of silver given as blood money to betray the Son of God. Yeah. Now, does that make any sense at all? I mean, it did to Judas... But if we look at this from God's perspective, do those fears and what it led Judas to do, does it make any sense at all? Completely irrational. So there they are. Let's put them back up on the screen. The three stories 
that include these characters and all of them had these irrational thoughts that led to irrational responses. It made sense to them, but it didn't make sense from God's perspective. And all of them had this in common. They were all motivated by fear. The chief priests and the scribes for planning to kill Jesus. The disciples for rebuking the woman who brought the offering. And Judas Iscariot for conspiring to betray the Son of God. So are you hearing the Holy Spirit yet speak to you about this? Are you hearing what the word of the Lord is saying? Here's what the word of the Lord is saying. If you're not hearing it yet, I'm going to put it right out there for you. You know, whenever we are motivated by fear, <laughs> we make bad decisions. That's right. We make bad decisions in our life when our judgment is impaired by fear in our life. And... For some of you in this room, that's happening right now. You're making some bad decisions based on fear right now. And they didn't even realize it was happening. Yeah. And we can make decisions based on fear and not even know it, that we're doing it. Yeah. It can seem perfectly right what, what we're deciding, and we're totally wrong yeah. because our decision is based upon fear. So you've had this happen to you. I've had it happen to me. I've, I was thinking about this, and what could I share that would be among the worst decisions I've made that could have been most costly? And I'll just preface this by saying I'm really, really glad that the Lord spared me yeah. from this one. Uh, there's, there's many in my life where I can see this happening, but, um, you know, for those who don't know me, I'm married to Rachel. We're going to celebrate 19 years of marriage this year. So we're excited. Yeah. For that. And, uh, Rachel's working in the nursery this morning. I have her permission to share this story. Well, that's um, good. Yeah. I thought, I thought that would be wise as a husband to get that done first. But, um, you know, if you don't know our story, I liked Rachel before I was even in high school. That's how long I, I just had a crush on her growing up and we were family friends. And by high school, I knew I wanted to marry her. That was my desire. We ended up getting married young. I got engaged when I was 18 and married when I was 19. And so that came with its own blessings and challenges, both uh, together. But before we got married, before we were engaged, um, I knew I liked Rachel. I wasn't sure she liked me. And of course, I mean, Rachel had other suitors. Yeah. There were other guys who were interested in her. And I was starting to feel some fear that maybe she liked someone else some insecurities about how she might feel about me. We hadn't expressed any kind of intentions for each other yet or anything like that. And because we were family friends, we were over at each other's houses a lot. And one day over at her house, I ran across her diary. Oh. Boo is the right response. <laughs> And I read her diary as a stupid, stupid teenage boy. I read her diary. Okay, then later I felt that conviction and I, I confessed it and told her I was sorry. And here's the worst part. A few months later, I did it again. Twice. Now, I am not sure why Rachel would forgive me and marry me after that. It seems a little irrational in my mind, other than she's a very forgiving person, and I know that the Lord brought healing for her, but that was a severe offense. And the offense, do, does anyone think that behavior was rational, especially doing it twice? It was motivated by fear. It was motivated by fear that she might like someone else, that if I knew who she liked, maybe I could do something about it. I couldn't control those outcomes even if I knew, right? I mean, but it was completely illogical. But in the moment of coming across that diary as a teenage boy, it made sense in my life. And man, I'm so grateful for God's redemption and that that didn't cost the future that God has given Rachel and I. And what we've shared for nearly 19 years now, the Lord can redeem. But man, fear led me to be at my worst in those moments. Well, she married you because she didn't come and talk to me about it. Oh, after okay. it happened. 
I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. So uh, Debbie and I had been married. I'd received an inheritance from my father uh, after he passed, and we had about ten thousand dollars in the bank, which was a lot of money, you know, back in nineteen and uh, seventy-seven, seventy-eight, and uh, and so you know that money's just sitting in the bank, and it's it's like an emergency fund, but I didn't even know what emergency fund was back then, mm-hmm. you know. We're poor seminary students. She's teaching school. I'm working part-time while I'm finishing my master's degree. And so it's not like we have a great deal of income. And, uh, and so I get approached about this investment opportunity in the oil business. And I'm thinking, I'm really afraid that, you know, that money's just sitting there. And it's not, it's not gaining any value whatsoever. And, and I was afraid that I was just going to waste this opportunity. Mm. And so I ended up investing in the oil business two different times. And, uh, and that's how well, stupid it was because the first one went sideways and I lost all my money. So I did it again <laughs> and lost all of that money. Mm. And so now we're broke, mm. you know, without any uh, emergency funds and emergencies happen. And, uh, you know, the question there is why in the world did she stay married to me during that time? Probably because she didn't talk to someone else that I didn't tell about what I did, right. you know? So anyway, fear can really cause it. You got another one, don't you? Oh, I, I do. I could tell a lot more. Yeah, and I, could I think, too. I think, you know, probably you get the idea that uh, fear, I, let me say it this way, way, as human beings, would you agree that we're at our worst? when our judgments are impaired by fear. I mean, you just heard it in both of those stories. Our judgments were impaired by fear and listen to the illogical, irrational conclusions that we reached because of fear. Fear can lead to all kinds of unreasonable behaviors that oppose the will of God. One of the things that concerns me right now is I see this operating in a lot of families when it comes to their children. Instead of parents operating in real faith in God's word and the principles of God's word, I see so many Christian parents operating in, in fear. Uh, and it's happening in our culture, in our society, but uh, I'm also sorry to say that it's carrying over into uh, parenting in the church mm-hmm. as well. For example, parents are allowing their children to decide that they're transgender or gay and so- supporting them in their decision. And why are they doing that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the fear of losing relationship with a child mm-hmm. or fear of hurting their child in some way by not supporting them in the current identity crisis that that child is having right. when they're very, very young. Yeah. And, and some are even going so far as to allow them to have these incredible surgeries you know, mm. to start changing themselves biologically mm. and taking all kinds of medications. Why? Mm. It's a fear yeah. of loss of relationship with, mm. the, with the children. And then also, uh, you know, it, parents are allowing their, their daughter's boyfriend to move in with them or vice versa. I mean, what parent in their right mind does that? You know, uh, why are they doing that? Well, you can say, well, they don't have a biblical worldview. Uh, I've seen people that claim to have a biblical worldview make really bad decisions out of fear. And it's the same reason. Yeah. It's, it's a fear of losing that relationship with that child that's motivating them. And then this is really happening all over the place now. It wasn't happening that much when I was 20, mm-hmm. you know, or 18. Uh, but parents are allowing their disrespectful, freeloading adult children to live with them. Mm. I mean, it's an epidemic. It's a pandemic in our society. Why? Why do you allow someone who's disrespecting you to receive your support when they're adults? Mm-hmm. You know, why don't, why don't you draw a line or a boundary and say, hey, you know, you can live here for a period of time, but if you're going to disrespect me and your, or your mother, you're going to have to... Not, Get another place. Yeah, you're an adult. You're an adult, you know. Come on. Why, what's, why, what's the motivation that's going on there in our society? 
And people think they're helping. Mm. They think they're helping their kids mm. by doing it. But in reality, in the long run, they're not. And it's because they're a fear of being rejected by their child. Yeah. And maybe they've had a previous rejection that's hurt them and wounded them. And they're, oh, I'm not going to do that again. You know, I'm not going to make that same mistake. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this one in particular since I have eight adult children. And, uh, you know, I have good relationship with all eight of adult children, praise God. Mm -hmm. and, but there's been some rocky moments during the course of parenting where both Sandra and I have had to draw a line. Yeah. Because they were showing us such terrible disrespect by a decision or judgment that they were making that we had to either remove our support or say, hey, you can't live here. Right. You're going to have to get your own place. You know, I wish that some of them that we've had these deals with could be here today because some of them would say, I'm so grateful that you did that, you yeah. know, that you took that stand. Mm -hmm. You know, you helped me understand some things that it wasn't the only thing I needed, but definitely it helped me. Right. So we can still love our kids and establish boundaries and, and require them to be responsible. Yeah, it can be the most loving thing. In fact, if, if we're, I, I have a fear because I fear the Lord that if I don't honor the Lord in the way I parent, that the outcome for my child's future is going to be even worse. That's the fear that we should have. But instead, we're often motivated by this fear of loss of relationship or something else that makes us make irrational decisions. You know, it's not just happening in parenting. It's, it's happening, happening with couples, yeah. too. And how couples are approaching family and marriage. Because of the fear of divorce, there are many couples in our society today who aren't getting married, but they'll live together. It's the fear of divorce. It's how it worked out for their parents. It's the divorces that they've seen or the divorces they've had in their past. And so because of that fear of divorce, instead they're, it's rational to them, but they decide we're going to just live in sin. And I'm, I'm not just talking about the world. Of course, we expect yeah. the world to, to do these kind of things. I'm talking about people in the church that are making these decisions based on fear, perhaps because of marriage or because of a fear of the kind of world that we live in or a fear that they won't be good parents or a fear that they're not going to be able to afford it. They decide not to have any children. And that that fear of whatever the reason is to not have kids just kind of gets them to freeze. And some even celebrate it. They, they call it dual income, no kids. We have all this freedom. You know, we're able to do all these things because we're smart and we didn't have kids. Listen, it's going against nature and God's design. And I promise you, if you're one of those young adults thinking that way, there's going to be regret in your future. Yeah. When you're alone and you're an adult... And go talk to some of the senior citizens in our church fellowship and ask them if they have relationship with their children, how important those relationships oh, are to them it's right critical. now. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a decision that you regret as you go against God's design who says children are a blessing from the Lord, but it's fear of my loss of freedoms and my disposable income or whatever environment my kids might live in that paralyze parents and lead them to say, I'm not going to have any kids. Yeah. Or because of a fear of not having enough money, married women never even consider if God might be calling them to be a full-time stay-at-home mom. Yeah. Oh, we got, we got to have the two incomes. There's, just no, there's no choice I mean, come here. On, that's... There's no choice. But they won't even consider, could this be best for our family? Could this be best for our children? I was raised in a home where my mom was a full-time stay-at-home mom. Yeah. I am so blessed that she made that sacrifice and my parents made that sacrifice for me. Rachel is mostly, she has her own business that she gives about five to 10 hours a week to and spends the rest of her time being a full-time stay-at-home mom. Now, I'm not saying that it, it would be wrong for a woman to work, but what I'm saying is if fear is keeping you on the sideline from even considering if this would be God's call in your life, it's an irrational motivation to keep working. You've got to be willing to reconsider that and seek the Lord. So listen to us again. We are at our worst when our judgments are impaired by fear. Yeah. Let me try to hit the full spectrum quickly for you. Would you listen and see if the Holy Spirit speaks to you through one of these? Fear can lead us to assume the worst about others and make unrighteous judgments towards them. Yeah. Fear can lead us to gossip or slander so, so others will like us or as a way to deal with our own insecurities. We talk bad about them so that we appear better because I'm afraid of what you might think of me. 
Fear keeps, leads us to keep our sin in secret instead of bringing it into the light. We know secrets make us sick. We know it's not good to leave things in the dark. We know there's no freedom in the dark, but we keep our sin in the dark. Why do we keep doing that? Because of fear of what might happen if our sin was exposed. Fear leads us to make poor financial decisions and, and to hurt, those, uh, hurt ourselves and hurt those that we love. Fear leads us to take God's good gifts for granted and to abuse them for our own pleasure. Fear leads us to tell lies so that others might think more highly of us or to protect ourselves from the consequences of sin. Fear leads us to isolate ourselves from a community of believers because we're fearing vulnerability or intimacy. If they really knew who I was, they wouldn't like me anymore, I'm afraid. So I'm going to forego the thing that God says I need the most, relationships with other people in my life and discipleship. I'm going to bench that because of my fear. Fear leads us to compromise our values and beliefs to fit in to avoid conflict. It leads us to blame others for our problems instead of taking personal responsibility for them. It leads us to neglect our health and our well-being. We're afraid of what the doctor might say so we don't go to the doctor. <laughs> How yeah. logical is that? It's illogical. Fear leads us to resist change and cling to unhealthy routines because we fear the unknown. Fear leads us to make impulsive decisions without proper consideration driven by some sort of panic or urgency. I feel like that was me reading that diary, right? Yeah, Just yeah. I feel this panic, this urgency. I got to do something and I make a poor decision. Fear leads us to overwork ourselves in an attempt to prove our worth and to avoid feelings of inadequacy. We've got some workaholics sometimes in Together Church, and we can hide behind our work to avoid confronting our feelings of inadequacy because we're afraid to confront them. And fear allows perfectionism to paralyze us, preventing us from starting and completing tasks due to the fear of imperfection. These are just a few. Can you see it? Can you see that we're all like these characters from these stories? All of us have battled irrational fears that lead to terrible, harmful decisions in our lives. Yeah, and like we said earlier, these characters in this story were operating in fear, and they apparently didn't even recognize it or didn't even know it. Yeah. And, and so uh, they are... <laughs> That's a terrible place to be. Yeah. It's another reason why it's so good to be in community yes. with other disciples. Because we can be operating and not even know it, mm -hmm. but one of our brothers or sisters can challenge us uh, in a very personal way that would help us realize it. You know, the schemes of our enemy can be just absolutely mm -hmm. so tricky, right? Uh, leading us to make bad decisions. And... and in a group this large, there, there's always people mm -hmm. that are actively living in fear. Now, you may call it anxiety. Right. I mean, we, our society is being medicated for fear. Yeah. And it, it's called anxiety. Mm -hmm. So you can call it different names. But so many are actively living in fear and making terrible decisions to end. That's the problem. Yeah. They're making those decisions because of fear. And perhaps you're here today and, or you're listening online and you've never even considered this mm -hmm. in your own personal life, just like in the people in these stories. And if you're seeing it this morning, hopefully red flags are going up for you and you're saying, I've got to do something about this. But one of the things about fear is can't it be so crippling? Yeah. Can't it just hold you in bondage? When I mean, it, you can spin and spin and spin on fear. So we've got to ask, What's the solution? What's the solution to this fear problem? Well, God's word tells us the solution. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Hmm. The solution, God's solution to our fear, our irrational fears, our crazy fears, is crazy love. And God's solution can be seen in the story today. There's only one character in all three stories that responds appropriately to Jesus. Yeah. Is that right? I mean, that character, it was not the religious elite. It was not the disciples of Jesus. It certainly wasn't Judas Iscariot. Only one character responds the right way. And it's the character who responds with crazy love for Jesus. It's this woman who comes and brings nearly a year's salary and dumps it out and anoints Jesus, overcoming her fear and offering this amazing gift to Jesus. Yeah, can you see the reasons why this woman 
could have backed out of doing this. Yeah. I mean, come on. Uh, she probably anticipated there would be others who would criticize yeah. her for what she did. It's a lot of money. Yeah, but she didn't let that stop her. Nope. And then this really wasn't socially acceptable. Right. I mean, this was a group of men at that, dinner. Was, that was having dinner. Yeah. And, and perhaps if she came in to help with a meal or something in their culture, that would have been appropriate. But for her just to walk into the meeting of men and all of a sudden pull out this perfume and pour it out on the head, head of Jesus, <laughs> that was really not socially acceptable. But right? man, she didn't let that stop nope. her. And then <laughs> it is true. She could have taken this perfume and, and, and sold it or used it for something else or, or the poor. And she could have thought about that before she did it. And she could have had those thoughts that, you know, I don't want to fear looking like I'm being a waste, wasting something, not being right. a good steward. I don't want to be looked upon as not being a good steward. So, right. you know, whatever. But she didn't let that stop her either. You see, despite all of these different risks that, that she was taking, she just pressed forward. Yeah. And she overcame her fear. We have to ask the question, why? Why would this woman do this when all these men were cowards? Yeah. You know, why? Why would, why would she do that? And, and the answer is, is because she had this incredible, crazy love for Jesus that caused her to lay down her fears. Yeah, perfect love casts out fear. The antidote for fear is love. And the woman in today's story is that example. Now, our love for Jesus, if we get it, it's really rational. Love for Jesus is not irrational. No, uh -uh. Once you understand what Jesus has done for you, it's very rational to love him back. But do you know that to the world, love for Jesus is irrational? Yeah. I mean, yeah. 1 Corinthians tells us that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, yeah. but to us who are being saved, it's what? The power of God. Yeah. And so when we understand the love of God and what he's done for us, it's a completely rational response for us to respond to God with crazy love, love that the world would cause, call crazy. When we're saved, God's love enters us and his love changes who we are. Instead of being defined by fear, if you're in Christ, listen to me, whether you feel it or not in this moment, you are a person defined by love. That is who you are. And people defined by love, let me tell you about them. We become the kinds of husbands, wives, and parents God wants yeah, us to be. Absolutely. People defined by love, we don't get threatened by others. We assume the best about others, and we're not threatened by our imaginations and what they might be thinking about us. We're free in love to build other people up instead of tearing other people down. I don't have to push you down to elevate myself. I'm free in love to build you up. We find freedom and power in forgiveness and loving others even when they have wronged us. We bring struggles with sin into the light, and we're not afraid of bringing them into the light. We're not afraid because we know God has forgiven us, and we're not afraid because we know God wants to redeem and restore us from our sin. Love makes us grateful for God's good gifts and motivates us to use them, like the woman in the story, for the service of God and the benefit of others. Love leads us to speak the truth in love with wisdom. And when we speak the truth in love, even in those hard conflicts, we're not afraid because we trust God with the outcomes and we're doing it from love. We find courage to press into community and relationships and our fears of insecurity or vulnerability don't stop us. We're willing to take risks like this woman to express our love for Jesus and serve him. We stand firm in our beliefs to not compromise the truth to avoid conflict. We end irrational reasoning and we're walking free from shame. Uh, we do not find us our sense of self-worth or self-identity in what the world says or what we own or what we feel. We find it in the one place we should find it, and that is in Christ alone. Absolutely. This is how perfect love casts out fears. Our, and when our fears are replaced with the crazy love of Jesus, it changes everything about our lives. Yeah, and so that's why this woman did what she did. She had this crazy, incredible love for Jesus because, why? Well, she believed in his, his crazy, crazy love. love for her. Yeah. You know? And 
Apparently, she had seen enough, she had heard enough at, that she believed mm -hmm. that not only was Jesus Messiah, but he had this amazing love for her mm -hmm. that caused her to put away her fears and come and bless him in the way that she did. And, and here's really what's crazy about her crazy love. Brandon, she didn't even know the whole story yet. No, she didn't. I mean, she, did, she didn't know what you and I know. Right. You know? And she still had this crazy love for Jesus. Uh, a few days later, after Jesus died, after he rose, after he ascended, after he, you know, appeared to his disciples, after he, like I said, ascended and then sent the Holy Spirit, man, she had to be really blown away. Yeah, by his crazy love. By his crazy love for her. And you know, Jesus hinted at it in this story. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel, there it is, mm -hmm. and they didn't understand the whole gospel yet. No. Wherever this gospel is preached in the world, the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. We're telling her story today because she had this crazy love for Jesus, unlike all the other characters. Yeah. And, and, and she put off fear because of that reason. And, you know, she wouldn't have known how incredible this statement was from Jesus when right. it was spoken that day. It wasn't like, oh, you know, she got it at that point. It was another act of crazy love from him towards her. Uh, he said this woman's act would be proclaimed everywhere wow. the gospel is proclaimed. Think about how incredible that is. What a statement. Yeah. What a promise. Absolutely. It's his crazy love on display again for this woman in response to her crazy love for him. And what is this gospel that Jesus said would be proclaimed? What is this crazy love God has for us? Well, the gospel is the story of God's crazy love for us. You see, the Bible teaches that we have all been born into sin. You're on the wrong side of the tracks the moment you're born. You're from the wrong zip code. There's nothing about you that would make you appealing to God. The Bible says you're born into sin and sin did my mother conceive me and there should be no reason why a holy, righteous, all-powerful God should even take notice of your life. But not only were you born into sin, the Bible says all of us have chosen to walk in sin. Ephesians 2 says we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Not one person in this room has lived their life without facing this decision. Am I going to love God and do what God wants me to do? Or am I going to do whatever sounds good to me in this yeah. moment and decided I'm going to do what sounds good to me in this moment? Forget God. Forget what he says. I'm going to do what I want to do. We have all sinned like that. And the Bible says that we, none of us have anything of value that we could offer God that would help us redeem ourselves or make ourselves right with God. Because of sin, we've all lost relationship with God. And there's nothing we can do to get that relationship back with God. So enter the God-man. Enter Jesus Christ. Enter the most visible act of crazy love that has ever existed on this planet yeah. or that the world has ever seen. God became a man, took on flesh, divinity incarnate, and he became like us and faced our weaknesses and our struggles and our temptations. And when he did it, he never, ever sinned. He never did one thing wrong and he was not deserving of death but he tasted death, not for his sin, but for your sin and for my sin. Now that's crazy love that he would come and die on the cross and become a sin for us. The Bible says that in our sin, we're enemies of God. That God would love us enough to let his son die for his enemy? I mean, I can't tell you how crazy that is. The closest thing I could think of is if Joe Biden sent Hunter Biden to take a bullet for Donald Trump. <laughs> It'd be the most crazy thing I could think of, yeah. a crazy, irrational act of love. Why would Joe Biden ever do that? I don't think he would. But do you know that that would pale in comparison yeah, to the God of the universe sending his son to take that bullet for you? Yeah to die in your place and take your sin upon himself and to go to that grave in sin and shame? He didn't deserve it. It's irrational. 
It doesn't make any sense. It's absurd. And then he rose from the dead to give you power over sin and death. Now that is crazy love. And the moment you begin to accept that this is God's love towards you, everything changes because here's God's promise. If any one of you will repent of your sin, and if you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will forgive all your sins because he paid them in full on that cross. He will give you a new life and put to death your old dead sin-filled spirit, and you'll be born again of the Spirit of God, a new creation with a brand new nature. He will cause his Holy Spirit to indwell you and empower you, and he will give you purpose in this life and, and give you everything you need to live for his kingdom and for his glory. Now, is that not crazy love? This is the love of our God towards us, and it transforms us. When we understand his love, it changes everything. Yeah, just think about it for a moment real quickly. Think about how the disciples of Jesus changed oh. after they came face to face with his love for them. And, and understood it. Yeah. I mean, here they were objecting to the perfume being They had spent. to look back on this instance and go, go what were oh, we what thinking? are we thinking? So it caused all of the disciples who were objecting at that point, it caused every one of them to go suffer for Jesus. Yeah. And the uh, majority of them died for Jesus yeah. because of their faith. Because they understood this. Yes. And because the love of God had been shed abroad in their heart. They no longer were operating in fear. No. They were operating because of their love for Jesus. It's caused missionaries, and we know some of them from this church, missionaries to go to strange places, hmm. to live with strange people to tell them about the love of God. This crazy love of God has caused people to surrender their lives to full-time ministry, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to shepherd the church. It's caused people to overcome fear and do things for God that they never thought it would be possible no. for them to do. And it's caused a countless, just an <laughs> incredible number of followers of Jesus to order their lives and then order their finances right. to expand the kingdom of God. It's all about understanding the crazy love of God yes. and, and being in love with God because of his crazy love for you. No gift seems unreasonable no. once you understand the crazy love of God. Yeah. So we got to ask, do you have a crazy love for God like this woman had? And she didn't even know the whole story yet. She's not even sitting as privileged as you're sitting right now when she acted with this love towards Jesus. Is your life characterized like that? Or is your life characterized right now, if you were honest, is it being characterized by some kind of irrational fear? Is this, there some area of your life that you're not living for Jesus because of some kind of fear? Perfect love casts out fear. Well, don't you want to stop living in irrational fears? I want that to be done. I never want a repeat of what happened with Rachel's diary ever again hmm. and, or any of the other dozens of stories I could tell you right now about how irrational fear led me to do irrational things. Don't you want to be like this woman and live, leave a legacy of crazy love for others to see? What a gift that wherever the gospel was proclaimed, this deed would be told about her. Did you know that it can start today? You don't have to wait. That kind of relationship with Jesus where your life is centered on a crazy love for him that is a rational crazy love because it was so irrational, his love towards you. It can start today. And the first place it needs to start is you need to make the decision, will you follow Jesus? Yeah. There are some in this room who have not made that decision yet. You have not decided that you're going to be a follower of Jesus. Will you believe this gospel that Jesus said would be proclaimed throughout the whole world and on the other side of the planet, 2,000 years later, we're the benefactor of this gospel being proclaimed right now? Will you believe that your sin separated you from God? Will you believe there's nothing you could do to make it right? And will you put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and a new life in him? I want to ask if all of you would bow in prayer with me right now. You know if God's tugging your heart. I don't have to tell you anything else. 
Will you stop wrestling with God? Will you decide right now that his crazy love for you is enough justification for you to love him with everything you got right back? Is there someone in this room with our head bowed and eyes closed who by a courageous show of hands would just say, I know I've sinned and right now I'm asking Jesus to forgive my sins and I'm deciding to follow him. Would you raise your hand if that's you this morning? You're making that decision right now. Would you raise your hand? Amen. Now I want to ask if you would all stand with me and I'm going to ask our baptism response team if they'll come. Britt and Lauren, Jack and Mallow, would you two come right down here to the front to my right and left? Jesus tells us the first step. When we have a crazy love for Jesus and we recognize his crazy love for us, he tells us how to make it known. It's not raising your hand in church. It's not filling out a card. It's not scheduling a meeting in the pastor's office. Jesus prescribed baptism for those who choose to follow him. Baptism is a picture of the crazy love of God for us. The water represents a grave. And what we're declaring in baptism is we're saying, I was a dead man walking because of my sin. But because of Jesus, my old self has died and we go into the grave. And then we come out and we say, and I am a new creation in Christ. And then baptism is a picture of God's crazy love in this way. We're saying, I know I have a body and this body, like Jesus' body died, my body's going to die. But God is not going to allow my body to stay in the grave because of his crazy love for me. He's going to raise me up when I was physically dead and could do nothing. He's going to raise me up to a new body and eternal life with him. That's the picture of crazy love and baptism. And God says, if you have decided to follow Jesus, you need to express your faith in his crazy love for you through the act of baptism. So this morning, I wanna invite you right now, whether you received Jesus just a moment ago in prayer, or a week ago, or a month ago, a year ago, or 25 years ago, if you have not followed Jesus in baptism, that is your next step of crazy love for him this morning. Be obedient. Stop resisting. Do what God wants you to do. Come and be baptized. So right now, is there someone who needs to be baptized? If that's you, we'll just celebrate you as you come. Would you come forward right now in this moment and say, I need to be baptized. And let's celebrate as they come forward this morning. Are there any others? Jack and Mal are ready right over here. Is there anyone else? Maybe you didn't come this morning thinking I'm gonna get baptized. It's okay, we got changes of clothes, towels and warm water, everything you need. So you don't have to worry about the logistics. You just need to worry about your heart. Will you obey Jesus? And will you be baptized? Is there anyone else that needs to respond to this invitation? All right, I'm gonna ask the rest of our response team to come forward because while we're waiting right here, I know that there needs to be an opportunity for you as a disciple of Jesus to respond. If you're anything like me in my history before I finally woke up to the crazy love of Jesus, there may be something you're hiding today. Some fear you're not addressing, some sin you're keeping in the dark, some decision you know you need to make to honor God, but fear has been keeping you back. Are you tired of allowing fear to control you? I tell you what, one of the best moments of my entire life was the moment I said, enough is enough. I am done letting fear control me in my life and I decided to get honest. Now some hard things followed, I don't wanna deceive you. Because of my sin and the brokenness sin can cause, there were some things to work through that were really difficult. But I stand before you today and say it's the best decision of my life. To come out of the dark and come into the light, 
to believe what God says about me is the truest thing about me, not how I feel, not what I think, not my opinions or the opinions of others, but what God says is the truest thing about me. I think there's some here crippled in fear. And you know the right thing you need to do, but fear has kept you back. You know what you need to share, but you haven't shared it yet. This response team is here to pray with you. So at this time, disciples of Jesus, we're no better off than the characters of these stories if we're going to be dominated by fear. You've got to step out of the dark and step into the light and be like this woman. Who's willing to step out this morning and bring it into the light and ask these to pray with you? Would you come at this time if you know you're battling fear and you need to overcome fear? Would you come right now and receive prayer? I see some already coming. This invitation is open to you and this altar is open to you. To kneel here before the Lord, to step out of the dark, to stop letting fear define you. Don't let shame define you. Stop believing the voice of your enemy and believe and trust in the voice of God. There is freedom for you. Somebody here needs to hear me say, there is freedom for you. You don't have to stay in bondage. Will you respond? Come and talk with one of these or come and kneel here at the front. Pastor Seth, will you lead us in a song?